This is New Romans 8. Uh, the lesson was presented in person on Sunday, February 21st. And this is a recording of the, uh, of the lesson. We will begin with Romans chapter 7, and in fact, the entire lesson is going to consist of Romans chapter 7. Father, we thank you so much for keeping us safe and letting us return. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds so that we can absorb what Paul has to say in this chapter of Romans. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Or do you not know, brethren, I'm speaking to those who know the law, in other words, we're talking to to people who are aware there, there is a law, and then here he is talking about the law of Moses. Uh, don't you know that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? Well, the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, he, she is released from the law concerning the husband. Now, he's using uh, a springboard here discussing um, a married woman who, uh, in one instance, leaves her husband while he's still alive and then goes and marries or is uh, joined to another person. I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about that because that really is not his point. Uh, he is not going to discuss uh, marriage laws and so on, and so we're not going. To, we're going to touch very lightly on that. Now the point is, though, that if she leaves him. If she leaves her husband while he is still living and goes off with another man, then she is a, an adulteress. But if her husband dies, then she is released from any legal attachment uh, to him and is then free to marry another person. If while her husband living, she joined to another man, she'll be called an adulteress, morikalis. Now, we have talked earlier about a word called pornea, pornea which means, uh, in general, it's uh, sexual immorality. But this is the specific word for adulterer or adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law. So she's not an adulteress, even though he, she is joined to another man. She gets free to go, and if she wishes to marry another man, and there is no casting of any aspersions against her. She is not an adulteress. Her, his death has freed her from any legal responsibility to him. Therefore, my brethren, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. And now we're, we're getting to his real point, which is not about marriage, laws, and so on. But the point is this. When Jesus died on the cross. He died for everyone. And because of that, everyone was redeemed by his 
spiritual and physical death on the cross and, and his resurrection. And Paul's point here is that when he died on the cross for you to redeem you, you, in essence, in a spiritual sense, died with him. And so, once you died with him, you are no longer joined to the law. Previously, you were under the, if you were under the law, you were joined to the law legally. But once you have died, you are no longer legally bound to the law. While we were in the flesh, he says, the fin sinless, sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. And this is his point. It's the relationship between the law and the person. He says, but now we've been released from the law having died to that by which we were bound. When sin died with Christ on the cross, then our slavery to sin, our being bound to sin, and legally bound under the law, but when Christ died, we died with him on the cross, and we died to sin, and therefore to the law. So that we serve now in newness of the spirit, not in oldness of the letter. What do we say then? Is the law sin? If, if, we, if we died under the law, if we were sentenced to death under the law, does that mean that the law is sinful? No, may it never be. God forget, forbid. On the contrary, I wouldn't have come to no sin except through the law. I wouldn't have known, for example, about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. I was going along happy and doing well, coveting everything, but not aware that I was breaking the law until the law came along and I became aware that the law says you shall not covet. Now sin Taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. So apart from the law, sin is dead. So I didn't know I was dead in sin. I didn't know that I was bound for an eternal, uh, in eternity in hell apart from God. Apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law. I didn't know about the law. I thought I was doing just fine. I coveted whatever I could get. And I was not aware that I was breaking the law. But when I became aware of the commandment that you shall not covet, sin became alive and I died. It killed me. And this commandment, which was intended to result in life, that is, if I followed it, proved to result in death for me, a sentence of death for me. Sin taking an opportunity through the commandment. In this specific instance, it's about covetousness, but uh, any of the commandments deceived me, and through it killed me. He is putting the blame for his death or his sentence of death on sin, not on the law. The law is holy, 
and the commandments holy and righteous and good. In the instance of covetousness, for example, it was entirely holy, appropriate, righteous, and good that there be a law against covetousness. But since I was not aware of it, I didn't know I was breaking the law. Once I became aware I was breaking the law, then I became aware that by my law-breaking I had sentenced myself, or sin had sentenced me, rather, to death. Therefore, did that which is good, that is the law, become a cause of death for me? Never, may it never be, and you could insert God forbid again. Rather, it wasn't the law, it was sin. In order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment sin would become utterly sinful. No choice but to understand that I was a lawbreaker, a sinner, and destined for death in that position. We know the law is spiritual, but I'm a flesh. Flesh here doesn't mean actually bones and muscles and so on. Flesh means his fleshly uh, uh, leaning and his fleshly sinfulness. I was sold into bondage to sin. What I'm doing, I don't understand. I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now, this is something that uh, is a little hard to grasp, so pay careful attention. He says, I know nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. Now, he's using flesh here in, 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 in contrast. It's the old flesh. It's the old person in contrast that, that, that to that which has been made alive in his new in me. Nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, the willing to do good, the willing to honor the law, to, but the doing of good is not. So in my flesh, flesh I, I will to do certain things. I will, now would like to be lawful and not sinful. But the flesh is still there, and the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Now, let me insert here uh, a, a friend of mine a pastor who made some statements that I have to disagree with. And what he says, the trouble is when you become a Christian, you are then saved, you are born again, you're born of a, uh, from above, and you are now saved. However, what has been saved at that point is your spiritual self leaving the soul as yet unsaved and the soul has to be brought along and while in your spirit 
you do, you want to do good and not sin, your soul says, I still like my liquor and my women and my drugs and whatever else. And the soul has to be convinced and brought along, but meanwhile the soul will lead you to do the old things that you wanted to do formerly, which you now hate, but you still sometimes do. He says, the good that I want, I don't do always, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I don't want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but it is the sin that dwells in me. Now, my friend says, the problem is once you become once you come to Christ and have been saved, there is still this old soul that has to be brought along in agreement with the spirit. And that is difficult, takes time, and causes great consternation in someone who has been genuinely saved. And Paul says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good, for I joyfully confer, concur with the law of God in the inner man, in my inner person, in my heart, in my spirit. I agree with the law of God. But I see a different law. I have to be careful because sometimes Paul and others, writers, will use law in a different sense. He says there's a different law in the members of my body. So this one, see, this person, Paul talking about himself, this person has got two different laws in him. He's got the law of grace, the law of faith, the law of faith and grace and peace and salvation. But he's got, there's another law working here, and that law is my old self with the old lust, the old things I wanted to do and which I enjoyed and thought were great. I got a different law in the members of my body now. He, See, this is a, not quite the same thing as the Mosaic Law. It's just a law, the law that is there. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin in my members. So that even though I'm saved, I'm, I, mean, I have eternal life, I'm going to heaven and not hell. I've still got this problem of this different law, which is still there, causing me great trouble and consternation. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Now, let me go back to the to the, my friend who says, well, you got to bring the, the soul along. In a sense, I understand that, but I'm not sure that he is exactly on track. However, for a long time, in relation to this particular passage, there has been an argument <clears throat> and uncertainty in people's minds about what is Paul talking about? Is he talking about his, uh, his uh, feeling bad, his consternation, and so on? Because he has not yet actually come to salvation. Is he talking about somebody who is now convicted that he is sin, but not actually saved? The Holy Spirit has not yet entered into him to dwell in his human spirit. 
And so he is under conviction, but not yet saved. That's the position some people have taken. Others, I think, wisely have pointed out that it's almost the universal experience of a new Christian that he expects that he will now get, live a godly life that he will take pleasure in spiritual things and be guided by the Spirit and not long after these things he used to. He used to feel good about in his sin. And he is perplexed. I now am a Christian. I'm assured I'm a Christian. But I do these things. I have these impulses. And that is horrible. Why am I doing that? And they say, this is the virtually the universal experience of new Christians. And that Paul is expressing that virtually universal experience. He is not simply a sinner under conviction. He is a saved person regretting the law of sin that still exists. Now, since we have not had questions, we have not had sidetracked things. Um, we now come to the end of chapter 7. This is going to be a, a short lesson. Look at this verse. This is the final verse. Romans 7.25 is the last verse in chapter 7 and Paul says thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then on the one hand I myself with my mind am serving the law of God but on the other with my flesh the law of sin now, I am so thankful that after chapter 7 comes chapter 8. I'm looking forward to studying chapter 8, but I don't want to do a little bit of chapter 8 and then bring it to an end. What I want to do is stop here and ref have you to reflect on things between now and our next lesson. Look at chapter 7 carefully at the points that he is making. One of the principal ones is that by coming to Christ in faith, and therefore come being by grace given eternal life that is being saved, being born again, being born from above, and now what we would call a new Christian. That through Christ's death on the cross, we died to sin. He kills sin on the cross. He died for everyone. He killed sin for everyone. That does not mean that by his death on the cross, everyone is saved. Everyone is redeemed by his death on the cross. He died for everyone. But 
in order to come to salvation. Here is the deal. I don't like to put it that way, but the, the, the situation is this. God the Father has promised God the Son that after your death on the cross and your resurrection from the dead, anyone who comes to faith and trust in you, I will justify. I will declare them righteous. I will apply to them the righteousness that you have, my son, and that I have. Dikeasune, the righteousness of God and of Christ, will be applied to this person. And as a consequence, I will declare them righteous. I will re declare them sufficiently righteous that they are no longer destined to go to hell, but destined to have eternal life with me and you and the Godhead. The Godhead. Father, we thank you so much for that. We look forward to studying the rest of this book of Romans. And we particularly look forward to the next chapter, chapter 8. Go with us and keep us safe, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.